Well, let us open the Word of God together to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Last week we looked at the first chapter, and as I told you last week, we did so because I've been reading through uh, this letter with uh, our brother Oren and was greatly uh, reminded and impressed uh, with the, the message of uh, this book, which is very much uh, a letter of love from the Apostle uh, to a church that he under God established and we see the, the background of that back in Acts chapter 17 and especially verses 1 uh, to 9. The heading for the first chapter was Paul's love to the Thessalonians and the heading for this chapter is Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians. I think I spoke on this uh, a few months ago here, but I purposely did not go to my old notes. I prepared a, a brand new uh, sermon. So if there is any carryover, that proves that I have some memory left. Um, but I purposely did not look at the previous notes. Um, so I'm looking at this as a fresh uh, message from this uh, chapter. And if you don't remember me preaching on this, all the better. Um, so the title for tonight's message is Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians in chapter 2. We won't read the chapter before we look at it. It's a 20 verses. We're doing an overview. It's a sort of a, it's going to be a bit of a pit stop look at the chapter. Uh, we will spend a little bit more time on the first few verses. And then the rest of the verses will just make one or two points as we go through. So this uh, will be a tour de force through the uh, through this chapter of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's good, um, it's good to do it this way. It's, it's good to do in-depth study of the Word of God, to get into a verse or a couple of verses. It's also good to see the broad overview of the Word of God as well. So as we get into this, um, let us pray that God would bless our meditations in his word. As I said, chapter 1 deals with the love of Paul for the church. And this is his ministry. And love and ministry go hand in hand. How can we say we love someone if we are not prepared to serve them? One could summarize these two chapters uh, in the following phrase from Gal Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. Just the last uh, five words of that verse. By love serve one another. Paul loved them chapter 1 and therefore he served them chapter 2. So in our time tonight we're going to look at the marks of Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians. What were the marks of his ministry? What were the identifiable characteristics of Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians? Last time we looked at four evidences and four reasons uh, for his love, evidences of his love and reasons for his love. Now we are going to look at the marks of his ministry or what it was, what type of ministry Paul had to this church. First of all, in verse 1, his ministry among them was effective, which one of us does not want an effective ministry among God's people. Uh, certainly if we're a minister we do, but all Christians want to be effective. We want to achieve something, don't we? We don't want to feel looking back over a number of years like, well, what was that all about? We want to look back with Paul and like Paul and say that what we did was effective. He says in verse 1, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. In fact, his ministry was so effective among them that when Paul asked them for prayer for his ministry in other places, 
He says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. In other words, what he's saying is, pray for me that my ministry might be just as effective with other people as it has proven to be with you. And he goes on to say in that chapter in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 2, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. And he says the the next phrase, as if they needed to be reminded of this, for all men have not faith. The impression I get from that verse in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 2 is that Paul is saying, listen, you live in in a sort of a bubble. (laughs) Let me... Let me remind you that outside of your church, there are very few people that have faith. It's like they were so blessed. Thessalonians were so blessed and Paul's ministry was so effective in that church that Paul was concerned in in 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 2 that they would come under the impression that, you know, everybody is like us. No, and even in the churches... There were people that had no faith. We can make assumptions. But what seemed to set apart this church from many others is that the word of God had real power with them. The word and Paul's ministry had been very powerful and very effective in their church and in their lives. Second of all, his ministry among them was courageous. And we obviously would have to tie these two in together. Uh, Effectiveness with courageousness. Verse 2. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated. He's talking about at Philippi. As you know, says in the verse, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. Now, I don't know about you, but if you'd preach somewhere, imagine preaching in, in Grafton Street next Thursday, and as a result, you end up in a dungeon with the rats crawling around your feet. I think you might be a little bit more Uh, careful about how you preach next time and Paul says how we were treated at Philippi Acts chapter 16 made no bearing made no difference to the way we preach the word of God to you in fact if anything it increased our courage we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. In other words, where even if we end up in the dungeon again, it doesn't matter. We will be as contentious. And sometimes, as Christians, and I was a bit of a firebrand when I was first converted, I'm not saying that to boast, but I didn't really care who I offended. I just went everywhere. In fact, I got to the point where, you know, I saw people crossing the street when, <laughs> you know, I was walking down the street and I could see people avoiding you. You know, I hope it was for the gospel's sake. Um, but, but a lot of us tend to get more, you know, um, placid, don't we? We start out really strong, really courageous. But then for various reasons, we tend to to lessen a bit. We don't want to uh, offend. We don't want to uh, be offensive. We don't want people not to like us and so on. Paul was not like that. Even George Whitfield was not the same near the end of his life than he was at the great times of the Great Awakening and so on. Paul never changed. He preached the word of God with much contention, courageously bringing the gospel. And that's why the word of God was effective. We need to be bold. We need to be courageous. And we see it um, in Acts 17. 
In Acts 17, verse 2, and Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the, out of the Scriptures, opening, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, he's saying this in the synagogue of the Jews, whom I preach unto you is Christ. He didn't beat around the bush. He got to the point. He's saying in a Jewish synagogue, the same Jesus whom you crucified, he is the Christ. And then we see the result of this in verse 4. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, some Jews believed, but a great multitude of the, the Greeks or the Gentiles, they believe, believed. And of the chief women, not a few. The Geneva notes say the virtues of a true pastor are freely without fear to preach the gospel even in the midst of dangers. There are too many preachers today in their safe boxes, in their safe areas, just filling in their time and not courageously preaching the gospel. But we all need to be like this. We all need to be boldly proclaiming Christ. Courageously. So that our word will be effective. And if we don't mourn. At the ineffectiveness. And something that Martin Lloyd-Jones said. In his series on revival. He said the church has never been so busy. And yet so ineffective. We need to mourn that. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. And maybe the answer. In fact I know the answer. Is in this chapter. We need to be effective. But the way to effectiveness. Is courage. But then thirdly. In verse 3. His ministry among them. Was pure. His ministry among them was pure. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. There was a purity about Paul's ministry. And this is also a vital mark of Paul's ministry. And what should be a vital mark of all our ministry. There must be not just outward courage. We could have that. But do we have inward holiness? Both of them must be there. For courage without holiness will please men. But will not please God. We must have this holiness. Where there's no deceit. No uncleanness. And no guile. Again the Geneva note says. To teach pure doctrine faithfully. And with a pure heart. What every preacher, what every pastor, what every Christian needs to develop is this pure motivation. This holy reason for doing the ministry. Not for any self end, but for the sake and for the blessing of the people. Then fourthly, his ministry among them was God-centered. His ministry among them was God-centered. Verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. Paul's ministry, even though, as Al Martin one time said, even though he served men, he did serve men, but with an eye to the pleasure of God. He looked to God for his approval, not for man. Note in this verse, first of all, he was allowed of God to be a minister. Then second of all, he was given this ministry as a trust or as a stewardship. Thirdly, he was to be tried in the very heart by this God. Therefore, in the middle of this verse, God was the one who was to be pleased. God was the one who allowed him. God was the one who gave him the stewardship. God is the one who would test him. Therefore Paul decided God was the one who was to be pleased. I mean, this is the problem. With, with, this is the problem 
with the church. It's worship. It's teaching. It's evangelism. All these areas. The church does not go to God. To see if God is going to be pleased. With these things. What Paul always asked. In what he did. Would God be pleased. With what I'm doing. Paul didn't say. Which is the most effective way or what way will work he asked what would God be happy with what would please God in what I am doing doesn't matter what people think doesn't matter what man thinks what does God think that's the question because God is the one who's looking into my heart I think too much of the modern church is like the Pharisees that have their reward in this world. But we must ask a greater question than what will work. Then fifthly, his ministry among them was honest. Verse 5. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. There's two main witnesses here. As ye know, you're a witness. But God knows. They knew him. But God knew him. He was honest. Never flattered people. This was true of the Lord Jesus. I think it was Nicodemus. Um, who came to the Lord Jesus in John 3 and said that we know that effectively what he said to him, we know that you are not uh, moved by men, that you are not the type of man that is, you know, uh, moved by what men think of you or by what you say to them. So often we're like this, aren't we? We say one thing to each other, in the face but say another thing behind our backs and we're all guilty of this we're not to use our words for our own ends we're so good at paying compliments to each other when we don't really mean it Paul never did that Paul never used flattery the word of God says that God hates flattery li- flattering lips So therefore, to use any type of flattery in evangelism, Paul says to the um, um, to the Athenians, "I see that you're too superstitious." So modern translation says you're very religious. Oh, I think he was stripping them down. He was saying this is all superstition. wasn't flattering them. wasn't saying, "Oh, you're very religious." Paul never went with flattery. To build men up. Paul went with the truth. To show people their need. And this was the secret. Of his true success. This was the secret. Of his ministry. In 2 Corinthians 2.17. He says. For we are not as many. Even in his day. As many. Which corrupt. The word of God. Now, if that was true in Paul's day, in apostolic times, that many were corrupting the word of God, how true is that now? We we are often shocked, aren't we? Are, Are all the churches wrong? Yes, majority of them are. It's it's what the scripture says. Time will come when the vast majority will abandon the faith. Don't be surprised by this. Are we wrong? Yes. Do we think we're right in everything? How foolish we would be if we think we are. So much that's wrong we need to look at. So much that we are doing wrong. And we are pretty close to the biblical model. I don't say that to um, boast. But at least from an outward appearance point of view. But listen, even in our church, there's need to look closely at what we're doing and measure it by the scripture. I love it when somebody uh, comes to me and says, well, why do we do it this way? And in case you think I'm, I'm, I'm threatened by that, I'm not. I love that. 
We need to be constantly looking at everything that we do and measuring it by the word of God. If we are doing something wrong, let us change it according to the word. That's all that matters. When I stand before God on judgment day, I want the well done, thou good and faithful servant. I hope we all want that. That's what I want. So if we're doing anything wrong, whether in worship or in any area, let us get it right so that God might say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what we want. So there's no threaten. Uh, we're not threatened by that. We want that. And Paul says back in that verse in 2 Corinthians 2.17, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. That's the mark of a godly ministry. That's the mark of a man of God. But then sixthly, and in case you're wondering with all the points follow the verses, yes. Uh, his ministry among them was humble and unpretentious. His ministry among them was humble and unpretentious. Verse 6. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Paul was not a type of minister or a type of an apostle who went into an area and says, well, here I am. You know, um, come to me and give me all my needs. No, there was a humility that neither sought man's applause or sought man's help. He could have. He had the right. In the word of God, he had the right to um, be supported by the, by the church. But he didn't seek this. We see the danger of seeking man's honour in the words of the Lord Jesus. In John chapter 5, 44. How can ye believe which receive honour one of another and seek not the honour that cometh from God only? The strength of Paul's ministry was that he sought his glory from God. Nothing wrong with seeking glory. It's where we seek it from. In fact, we must as Christians be seeking for the glory of God and for God to honour us. We must be seeking for that. But if we're seeking for, for, for honour from men, that's the wrong place. That again is receiving your reward in this world. The well done, thou good and faithful servant is the thing that we must be looking for. The thing that we must be seeking. The thing that matters. But then seventhly, his ministry among them was caring. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth or cares for her children. The, the emphasis of this is that a nurse will care for any child, won't she? A nurse will care for, for anybody's child. You put a nurse in a room with any child that needs help and a nurse, especially a, a child nurse or a pediatric nurse, will look after the child. But notice the emphasis in this verse. It says, even as a nurse cherisheth her own children. Paul says, I wasn't just caring as if you were any child. I was caring as if you are my children. That's much stronger. His ministry among them was caring. Paul exhorts Timothy in like manner in 2 Timothy 2.24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves of God peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. We are to be gentle as Christians. I know I've fa failed many times in this area. 
I like to tell myself sometimes that I'm gentle, but I know I'm not. I know often I'm not gentle, but Paul was gentle. It didn't mean that he was a pushover. It didn't mean that, you know, people could take advantage of him. But his disposition was like that of the Lord Jesus. Meek and lowly of heart. That was his disposition. Again, it doesn't mean that he was a fool. It doesn't mean that people could take advantage of him. But he was gentle and caring and loving in his ministry. What a, what a wonderful contrast. Here's the effective, courageous, bold evangelist. And yet it's at the same time, this loving, caring, compassionate one of souls. And eighthly, his ministry among them was unconditional. His ministry among them was unconditional. Verse 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only. That would have been enough. That would have been more than enough for needy sinners. But also our own souls. His ministry was unconditional. He gave everything. Paul didn't say, well, can I go into this place and, you know, do my job. Do my job and then leave, as many do. No, he said, how can I give myself to this people? How can I display? Yes, preach. But how can I display the love of Christ to this people? Because you are dear unto us. There's the challenge. That's the challenge for us all, isn't it? We fail. Yes, we fail. But we must strive to be like Paul. Again, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, 14, he goes into this a bit more. He says, Behold, a third time I am ready to come to you and will not be burdensome to you. Listen to this. For I seek not yours, but you. Isn't that wonderful language? I seek not yours. I'm not after your things. I'm not after your possessions. I'm not after your money. I'm after you. I want you. You know, today we have these prenuptial agreements. <laughs> That's not love. You know, yeah, I want to get married to you, but I want to protect myself at the same time. Paul didn't protect himself. Paul just came open souled to them. His soul was open before them. He says in the next verse, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. There's the mark of his ministry. Unconditional ministry he goes on to say though the more abundantly I love you the less I be loved that's so true it, it shows the wickedness of the heart of man where I lived there were some parents who were very cruel to their children but for some reason their children grew to love them and parents who were very loving and very giving, their children grew up to despise them. What is it about the wicked heart of man that when we love each other, it actually pushes people away? What is it about that, that we seem to love those who don't love us? Hence the, the whole sort of um, idolization of, of you know sports stars and pop stars and so on who never know us or never will know us and yet we love them as if they had given everything for us and they've given nothing for us and yet those who actually do give we tend to despise just like we despise God it's the same thing isn't it God gives us everything and yet we treat him so badly Then ninthly, his ministry among them was self-sacrificial. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. 
self-sacrificial. Geneva notes again says to let go of his own rights. His right as an apostle. His right as an evangelist and preacher. He let them go rather than to be a cost to his sheep. Adam Clark notes, from this it appears that St. Paul spent much more time at Thessalonica than is generally supposed. For the expressions in this verse denote a long continuance of a constantly exercised ministry, interrupted only by manual labour for their own support. Labouring night and day because we would not be chargeable to you. Probably Paul and his companions worked with their hands by day and spent a considerable part of the night or evenings in preaching Christ to the people. What a man Paul was. What a man. You know, we can think about the preacher, we can think about the apostle, but what a man. Here's a man's man. Here's a real man of God living and giving and doing everything for the sake of his people his ministry among them was self-sacrificial but then tenthly his ministry among them was sanctified his ministry among them was sanctified verse 10 ye are witnesses again it's the dual um, witnessing here ye are witnesses and God also both you and God know this to be true (laughs) which one of us could say that I would be afraid to say that. I might be foolish enough to say some of you know this, but I would certainly not say the second. How holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believed. That believe. Holy in his dealings with God, just in his dealings with man, and unblameable in his dealings with his own soul is maybe the way we could apply those three but then his ministry among them was practical verse 11 as you know how we exhorted comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children we were talking over the last couple of weeks about certain ministries in the town about giving food to people and there's different views I've heard on how much there was an allowance made for witnessing and so on but Paul was not a social worker (laughs) was he? he was not preaching a social gospel even though Paul all that we set up to now all that we have said thus far Paul was not backward in exhortation comfort and charging every one of them as a father doth again his children Paul treated them like a mother but he also treated them like a father every aspect and every minister will say and know well not how much he fails but knows that he fails in many areas Paul didn't seem to fail he seemed to cover all the points He seemed to be a perfect minister, if I can say that about him. He seemed to be a a fully orbed minister of God. He done everything that was needful for them. Exhorting them, comforting. Fathers fail so often. Some fathers can be, you know, good with the with the with the lash, but not very good on the love, and vice versa. Paul as a father was good in the overall relationship with his people if they needed exhortation he would do it if they needed comfort he would do it if they needed to be told what to do he would do that as well but then twelfthly his ministry among them was challenging verse 12 that ye would walk worthy of God He wasn't behind when it came to telling them the standard to which they were to live their Christian life. You're you're to walk no less and live no less than a walk and a life worthy of God himself. As if God was living your life. There's the point. Who hath called you unto his kingdom. And glory. If God is calling us to heaven, if God is calling us to glory, we are to live like that. 
This goes back to this, this morning's message. We're to live like we're going to glory. We're to be like the one who was on that path that gets brighter and brighter onto the perfect day. But then his ministry among them was rewarded. Verse 13. Rewarded in their obedience. That was the reward. This is wonderful. Paul's reward wasn't money or, you know, a a big name. No, Paul's reward, according to verse 13, was in their obedience. For this cause also, we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you to believe. That was reward enough for Paul. But they obeyed the gospel. Is it McShane who talks about when his people stand with him in glory? When his, his congregation whom he preached to stand with him before Christ. He says on that day my heaven shall be two heavens in Emmanuel's land. That was Paul's reward. The obedience of his people. Then his ministry among them was imitated. Verse 14. His ministry among them was imitated. For ye brethren became followers of the churches of God which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen even as they have of the Jews. It it goes beyond now just Obedience. Now it's suffering. And what a joy it is when we see one another willing to suffer for the gospel of Christ. That's when it becomes really real. And Paul rejoiced that these were not just professors. These were not just those who claimed to believe, but these were willing to put their very life on the line and become imitators of Paul and all the churches of God which are in Judea. His ministry among them, 15, verse 15, his ministry among them was persecuted. Who both kill the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. And have persecuted us. Speaking of the Jews in verse 14. And they please not God. And are contrary to all men. Paul was persecuted in his ministry. We often say don't we how little we're persecuted today. How little trouble we seem to get into. As we preach the gospel. We shouldn't look for it. But I think we're right to ask the question, why? Apathy is the worst thing, isn't it? Apathy is the worst thing. We want to see something happen. And Paul saw it all. He saw all the experiences. And here in this 15th verse, he had the persecution. (coughs) But then he had the opposition. In verse 16, his ministry among them was opposed. Verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. But then, starting to be like a Puritan sermon, isn't it? 17thly, his ministry among them was enduring. Verse 17. But we brethren been taken from you for a short time in presence. Not in heart. In other words what he's saying here. There's there's no way we can be taken from you except in body. Because our heart is with you. Endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. The one thing the Thessalonians didn't seem to ever do is give Paul a reason not to love them. There's a lesson for us, isn't there? 
He seemed to just want to be with them all the time. They never gave him a reason not to love them. We as Christians must give each other reasons to love one another. Not to do things that will make it difficult for each other. That's a real challenge, especially in a small church. It's a real challenge, isn't it? And I know I've given you many reasons not to love me. But we need to be so careful. We need to be so careful because the devil, and we'll see this in the next verse, is just waiting to get in there. His ministry among them was enduring. But then verse 18, his ministry among them was pivotal. Why do we say that? Because the devil, in a particular sense, wanted to separate Paul from this church. In a particular way, Satan wanted wanted to put a wall between Paul and this church. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But Satan hindered us. Every time Paul was trying to get to them, Satan himself comes and opposes it. For Satan knew that his ministry among them was pivotal to their blessing. Verse 19, his ministry among them was Christological. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Everything comes back to Christ. Our hope, our joy, crown of rejoicing. To stand together in the presence of Jesus Christ. When he comes, and he'll get into this at the end of chapter 4. And he'll say, wherefore, brethren, comfort one another with these words. It's looking to Christ. It's not looking to an event. Too many talk about use words to take the attention off Christ. It's looking for Christ. It's looking for His return and His appearing. Then finally, His ministry among them was satisfying. That's what we want. Why do people leave churches? I don't believe that anybody leaves a church because of some doctrinal differences I will say that boldly nobody leaves a church and if somebody claims they're leaving a church because of one or two doctrinal differences I would say humbly they're not being honest with themselves and with the others they're speaking to the reason we leave churches is because we've ceased to be satisfied with Christ in that church for ye are our glory Paul is not saying all your doctrinal I's and T's have been crossed and therefore you are our glory and joy no ye personally ye personally as people are our glory and joy We sometimes like, you know, when a a couple break up, whether it be in a relationship or a marriage, and we'll say, ah, she will still be friends. (coughs) We should love one another so much that even when we differ, and we will differ, And I have the great privilege and responsibility of being able to say what I believe from this pulpit and you have to listen to me. But we have to be patient with one another. And what will help us in that is when we see one another as our very joy. 
That's the strength of the church. That was the strength of Paul's ministry. Paul wasn't, oh, he could have been an academic. I heard one person saying, I don't know how they actually measure these things, but someone claimed that Paul was probably in the top five or the top ten of the great minds that ever lived. But that wasn't the strength of his ministry. This was the strength of his ministry. His love for God, his love for Christ, and his love for Christ's people. That was the strength. And the strength of this church will not be the doctrines we can agree on. Yes, that's very important. But the strength of this church will be our love one for another. That will be the strength. Because good doctrine without the love is like a sort of an empty building with no windows and no heat. You know, we don't want to be just a, a building. We want to be a home where people feel at home. And if I'm getting that wrong, tell me. I feel sometimes you ignore, you, you, you think it, but you won't say it to me. Say it to me. I won't bite you. And if I say it to you, don't be frightened off. We need to love one another, and whatever we can do to achieve that, we must do. May God help us. Let us stand for closing prayer. Oh Lord, help us to see one another as our joy. That we might love the brethren. That we might see Christ in each other. And that when we fail, we would lovingly deal with one another. That we would not do it in a way that is ungodly. O oh Lord, forgive me for my ungodly dealings. Forgive me for my sins. And help me, Lord, to put right all the things that I do wrong in my relationships with the brethren. And may we all, Lord, live knowing our weakness, but yet desiring to be a blessing to one another. O oh Lord, help us. Be gracious to us this night. We give thee thanks for those things that we shall receive. And the grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And the love of God our Father. And the communion of the Holy Ghost be with us all. Amen. Amen.